what's special to you about the Jiva Theater Center in Rochester? It seems like that like, town- Literally the greatest questions I've ever been asked. Wow. Seriously, like I'm, I'm blown away by, I don't know who's working for you, but and don't <laughs> fire them. <laughs> what would you say distinguishes a fan who recognizes you from Get Out versus someone who knows you as Parking Pa Tueyo? You are hilarious. <laughs> you, you are not Nadva. Nadva. <laughs> That's you, bro. Um, <laughs> Did you have a biggest customer pet peeve when you were going by Vooner and waiting tables at the uh, at the Aussie <laughs> Cafe? My biggest customer pet peeve, man, your research is deep, bro. Vooner, <laughs> that is. Oh, I got some friends that are gonna shit when they hear that you, that you figured that out. To the bottom. Question: What's the most painful thing that's ever happened to you? Oh. Other than being dumped at the prom, what's the most painful? <laughs> well, that was you at shit. homecoming on the. Oh, uh, motherfucker! <laughs> I read the book, Dave. I read the fucking book. I read the book. <laughs> when I went to the Midwest Fur Fest, and Rose shout out and Rosemont, Rosemont, Rosemont Illinois Convention Center, go. baby. There we go, right off the blue line. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I I get asked by chefs all over the world, um, "Is he that good?" It's Sean Evans. I said, "He's the real fucking deal." Let me tell you, oh, well, he's wings you. are shit, but the questions are great. <laughs> You did a deep dive in the book. I'm very impressed. <laughs> so in your latest project, Shining Veil, you played the role of Patricia Phelps, a mother who moves her dysfunctional family away from the chaos of city living in Brooklyn and towards this creepy haunted mansion in the country. And showrunner Jeff Astroff recently said in an interview that you called him to tell him, this script is the only thing that's ever been written for me. What was it about the character that gave you such a strong gravitational pull towards the project? Okay, first of all, is there something behind me that you're reading? Because who can do that? <laughs> I couldn't wow. tell you that much information about the show ever. That was incredible. Oh, well, as an actress, I, I, I take that as such a compliment. Thank I, you so I much. I swear there's got to be something behind me. How does rapping on the comeback stage at Inkigayo mm -hmm. with a parrot on your I shoulder? I can't believe you said Inkigayo right now. I did, I did. It's so weird <laughs> to hear it from you here. But you love it, yes. Rapping with a parrot on your shoulder, how does that complicate a live performance? Oh, wow. That one. Okay. It kept biting my hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kept biting it and talking to me. It was interesting. Reflecting on the 20 or so sets that were built for the 2015 Best Picture nominated film, The Martian, which one was the most jaw-dropping or impressive to actually see in person? I think the facts that you have right now are pretty impressive. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. One of your passions that I know that you pursue in your downtime is diving, which you've been doing since you were 10 years old. I love diving. Besides that time that you had to be transported to a decompression chamber oh for God, eight hours after an especially about deep me. voyage. <laughs> What's the institutional significance of square one for a young person growing up in Mississauga? My God, that's a deep cut. <laughs> um, square one, man. Oh, God, I'm impressed. Pound for pound, what would you say is the throwback underground Lizzo rap song that had the hardest bars? Wegula? You're so wild. How do you know about that? Oh, stop it. I didn't know you was a Wegula. <laughs> Tell these people I used to rap. Um, I mean, let's. we got to give it to Batches and Cookies. I was rapping so fast. Remember that gooey gooey you took and said ooey yooey I need two or two of these for my baby booey yooey Floating like buoys, you got a nice pair like some boobies Are you high up that doobie doobie with your Mr. Re Machine Scooby? Feeling bad where you should be beef you don't make nothing Stop, it, it keep going Still got it <laughs> I still, still got fucking it. got it <laughs> So I read that you wrote your first play inspired by the film Good Burger when you were only nine years old But I'm actually more interested in this deep cut from Holly Hughes Who said that you wrote a great piece about a pair of grime artists when you were just a teenager <laughs> What do you recall about that time at the Heat and Light Youth Company in Hempstead Theater? You're like Nodva. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Holly Hughes. So I've heard you talk about forgetting your lines at the Euphoria audition and then blowing a self-tape because you were copying Zac Efron's performance in Charlie St. Cloud for a show that required wow. an American accent. You do dig. <laughs> you do dig. They say one thing about you. <laughs> You're a digger. I'm a spiceman who digs. I'm a spiceman who digs. <laughs> It's amazing that you busted out the ice cream for this win. Can you extol the virtues of eating ice cream with a fork? And do you still do that for efficiency? A hundred percent. If I would have gotten the, the, the utensils here, it would have been a fork. <laughs> Good knowledge, by the way. <laughs> the, when your ice cream is like really hard, especially if you're using a fork, it contacts, like there's a smaller amount of surface area. 
Bro, don't ask me to explain <laughs> science. <science. laughs> Why have you given me the bomb? What are the fun facts that you have over on that table? Can you speak to the special personal significance of the West Side Highway to you? Oh, I do love the West Side Highway. God, what? Do I talk about all these things publicly? <laughs> Why? Um, I do love the West Side Highway. I, I, I you know, I've just, I, I go running there and I've, I've been in there in tears. <laughs> I've, been, I've been in it, you know, I, I felt like through a lot of different times in my life, you know, it's like, for some reason, I don't, I don't know. It's just like my, my happy place. Is it true that you blew the audition for the Fly 2 by over committing to the metamorphosis project? How do you know this? That's cool. <laughs> That's fishing. I like when that happens. Over yes. Over committing to the metamorphosis, riding on the ground, foaming from the mouth. It was it was the fly too, and I went in there, man, and I totally committed. And I did this for like 22 years with pretty much every audition I ever did. <laughs> but I, I was on the ground, and I was frothing at the mouth because he's in a chrysalis. He's in a cocoon. Like, right. What happens to one that's human that's not used to something like morphing from one thing to another? One would imagine that it would be a painful process. Would one not? And then you finish the audition, which is always the most uncomfortable part, where they all look at you and there's a pause and they go, thanks for coming in. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. And I go, okay, is there anything else you want me to do? Or is I can do it, you know, if it, that, that wasn't appropriate, there's another way we can deal with it. And they go, no, that was fine. That was great. And then I left and I got back to my place and there was already a message from my agent. And I called the agent back and he said, what the fuck did you do in there? Do you like Wiz Khalifa's music? Yeah, like, I mean, especially like early stuff. He had that like Kush mixtape. You listen to rap. Oh. You do. You know about Kush and Orange Juice. Mm -hmm. You're a rap fan. Yep, yep. That's awesome. Because I didn't know if you were just saying it because you like, cause you know what's what interviewers do. They mirror. Oh, right, but right, You right, know right. about Kush and Orange Juice. Wiz yeah, Khalifa's yeah. 2011 hit mixtape from datpiff.com. <laughs> yeah, I remember the the cover art. Remember he's like yeah. in that like pinstripe, uh, he's in that like pinstripe suit. First time I ever smoked weed was to that song. The Kid oh, really? Frankie. Song number eight. <laughs> I was at a, uh, hiding under a slide at a local playground with six dudes standing around me being like, hit the blood, hit the blood. You know, <laughs> you know that song? If you want to make a weed song, now here goes a weed song. Still blazing, still blazing, still blazing. That ganja flowing so amazing. <laughs> Actually. I was smoking weed to that one. Was that, um, was that during the Trek God days? <sighs> you, you saved that one for the last wing, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, for those who don't know, what and who is Trek God? Well, what should we eat? Can you? You want me to start rapping, huh? Mm-hmm. So your new show, True Story with Ed and Randall, is a hybrid, scripted, unscripted series where regular people tell you and Randall Park their craziest personal anecdotes, which are then brought to life through dramatic reenactments. How much of a good story would you say is in what actually happened, and then how much of a good story is in how the story gets told? Well, that's a great question. It, 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 it's it's going to come down to the balance between the two because something incredibly mundane can be so funny if it's told really well. I remember Lewis Black, back when I was on The Daily Show, we would be meeting up at a taping somewhere, like a remote somewhere, and he would just start talking about his trip to the location and about his interaction with the, the cab driver that was crazy and then someone spilled coffee on did the dumbest sort of story, but he was so funny. He could just kill us with these these simple stories. Then, if you have a really, like a story that's inherently crazy, then it actually doesn't need a whole lot of topspin. So I'm interested in that fundamental part of being an actor, which is deciding what projects you're interested in based on what's on the page. What is the actual process of reading scripts like for you? Like, how is it different, if at all, from reading for pleasure? Um, it's a nice question. Um, Sometimes a script can be really good and you can feel really strongly about it and and it, and it could be really I did a thing called the North Water on television and it was Love so that show, it was so way. oh thanks man it was so dark and it was so heavy and it was so grotesque and it 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 really was concerned with the darker recesses of the of the human experience and the human mind um and the ugliness that we're capable of which is visible everywhere we go of course but this was condensed into 5 hours of really heightened drama and reading it was it was a task but it was still brilliant. It was still really enjoyable. I was still gripped by it. And sometimes you read scripts and, and you don't connect and you, you in any way. 
and but sometimes you need money and you go and do them anyway. That's <laughs> happened a couple of times. So in describing the process of working with you to design your family's LA farmhouse home, uh -huh. Howard back and said, we talked about everything from beam sizes to the details of the cross bracing to the junctures of the wood planks and concrete. Is there a detail of your home that you're particularly proud to have your fingerprints on? And then is there one that serves as a reminder that marriage is always about compromise? Ooh, really good question. Um, when we were building out our island, I insisted on having a dog inlay, like built in little dishes for the dogs and built in food, you know, for the dogs. And so everything kind of looks beautiful and clean and nice and neat. And the dogs always have a permanent place instead of me tripping on their dog dishes or whatever. So to me, that was like one of those where I was like, I really want a built in dog eatery. Um, and then as far as making compromises, yes, I am five foot four on a good day. My husband's six foot three. Our house is built for six foot three. I am at all times on tippy toes. And so I felt like that was a really good marriage compromise I made. I have ladders everywhere. I have a ladder in the closet. I have a ladder in the kitchen. I can't reach things. Can you recall an instance ever a time in which your formal acting training brushed up awkwardly with the realities of being on a Hollywood set? Well, <laughs> that's a really interesting question. Um, when I did the movie Diner, I learned a great lesson from Barry Levinson. Being young and also really coming from the stage, I tended to be kind of bigger, you know, and tended to want to put it out into the back row, whatever it was that I, I was feeling. And he was like, you know, don't don't play it so much. Yeah, you know, you can just, uh, you know, you know, lesson. It's you know, and 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 so. I did less, and I did less, and he would have me do less again. And that was a great sort of lesson to me. And your style of prank, like the wallet drop, for example, kind of shows the duality of human nature. Does playing out these thought exercises at such scale, does it make you more optimistic or less optimistic about society as a whole? Mm, that's a good question. I think, honestly, I feel like it's like more optimistic. I feel like people are surprised that people are more honest than they normally are. Now, porch pirate package, people stealing that. It's like, of course, I'm not gonna air the person who walks by and doesn't steal the package, right? Of course, if you open it, then we reward you with like a pound of freaking glitter and an uncharitable amount of fart spray. In 2013, your OG girl group, 21, did a collaboration with Chrome Hearts, which yeah. now, almost 10 years later, that's like every rapper's favorite designer. Mm -hmm. How would you explain the aesthetic appeal of that brand to someone who wouldn't know Tom Ford from Tom Hanks? Mm. Damn, I can't believe you know that, first of all. <laughs> um, I bought my first piece actually in Hong Kong when I was 12. I was such a fan of it. So I went there by, by myself, um, didn't tell, you know, any of my family members and bought my first piece and, you know, had it on when, on my special occasion and met um, Jessie Jo, who's the daughter of the Sarks family and became really great friends. And we performed together when she was back in Korea. And it was like a, a dream to me to collaborate, just making something, creating something new with my friend. So it became that which is more fun. And I think it's awesome that it's a big thing now, but yeah, it's like, I'm a personal fan of the brand and have always been. What's the best lesson you learned about scoring from Gus Van Zandt? Oh, right. God, that was cool that I got to, how did you know? <laughs> wow, um, yeah, I sent him the film and he was really nice and he gave me advice. I think he even said something like, trying to tie in the tone of the movie because a lot of times you want to play against the tone of the film and uh, and by doing a different kind of <laughs> score. <laughs> Is it true that the bathtub scene and Jeff who lives at home came about with the Duplass brothers, basically just pointing cameras at you and Jason Siegel and then just letting you riff in a 40 minute long uninterrupted improv session? <laughs> yes, um, <clears throat> but actually uh, that was the whole movie. The entire movie was improvised. This was improvisation in the service of like making the dialogue sound as real and visceral as possible. And that was really a fun challenge. I'm, I'm super proud of that movie. I'm glad you brought it up because it doesn't come up very often. And, uh, and it was a great, great project. What did you learn 
sneaking out to go to the punk rock club Godzilla's as a teenager? Like, what do you think you learned about yourself? I don't know how you know this, man. You're freaking me out. <laughs> Be careful, 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 careful. No, okay, okay. Don't manipulate me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a most treasured memory from the time that you spent a year studying abroad at Shakespeare's Globe Theater in London? You know, you know so much. <clears throat> it's amazing. <laughs> um, you know what? Mark Rylance, watching Mark Rylance, he was in um, Richard II. And he was really good. Um, I wanted to cry today, so this will be good. <laughs> um, and um, anyway, he was so fantastic <laughs> that <laughs> I still can't get over it. What role did Beanie Siegel play as a creative oh, influence on your character in that bro, film? I get to say this out loud. <laughs> okay. Beanie Siegel, yeah? <laughs> That scene. You like yeah. that one? So when he said that, yeah, I love that one, bro. I tell you, you're like Nardvot. Like, <laughs> like, I don't even know if I'm saying it right, but hey. Um, Beanie Siegel. So when I was younger, I was obsessed with worldstarhiphop.com. And there was a bit when Beanie Siegel was just on his shoulder while PD Crack was rapping and just looking at him while he's on his shoulder and coming looking at him. But he's not looking at the camera, just looking at PD Crack, looking at PD Crack. And then like PD Crack trying to rap. And I always remembered how awkward that was and how Thing. And that's how I kind of act. I just I take stuff in, and I, I like looking at life and real life moments, and go, how do you translate that into a film language? Like actually get reality. So then, like when he said, intimidate him without touching him, it just came. It just popped in. Like me watching it, at 16 years old. What makes Florida such a content mecca? Like the eccentrics that that's you find out there. That's a good question, man. It's a, it's a problem. Florida has a huge mid-level celebrity influencer culture. Jackass uh, influenced. Juggalo adjacent, harm <laughs> heavy, Vegas vacationing contingent. That's Florida. Shout out to Mike Busey in the Sausage Castle. That's what I think of. Everybody at the Sausage Castle has 15,000 Instagram followers. So one of my favorite parts about your conversation on Pete Holmes's podcast is when that you recognize that the comedy club in Crashing is actually a replica of the Boston, mm. a since shuttered comedy mm -hmm. institution where you began your career. Thinking back on those days when you were hosting the Monday Night New Talent Showcase, what about that time in your career do you miss the most? And then what's a harsh reality about making a career in comedy that you had to learn the hard way? Great questions. Um, I think what I miss most about that time was, it's sort of hard to articulate, but there's this feeling when you're in the comedy clubs as, a, as when you're really starting out and you're young and there's nowhere to go but up. You know, you're at the bottom rung and it just feels like anything's possible. Your dreams are still like tangible. And after you're in it for about a year or so, and it's down to like a pretty core crew of really committed comedians, you really feel a part of something, like a part of a, a comedy freshman class, if you will. And then you had upperclassmen that, that were like slightly more established. And then you had like, you know, the seniors that were out there tour, like doing big tours and stuff. Um, I don't know, I felt part of something. It was a special, special time. I've heard you make the point that cheap toys have the most clever designs by necessity. What's a classic children's toy that you recognize for its STEM ingenuity that the rest of us might take for granted? <sighs> Great question. How dare you make me think <laughs> under these conditions? <laughs> um, do you know what makes a frisbee fly? No, but I'm on the edge of my seat. This is great. This is amazing. <laughs> so basically there's two things. One is the angle of attack, which, you know, when it flies, it flies a little bit like this. So it's bumping into stationary air molecules and basically deflecting up. It's like conservation momentum, right? It's a reaction. Same thing when you put your arm out the window, it goes up and down, right? You're bumping into air, which is a fluid, and it's causing it to go up or down. That's the first thing. The second one, which is really fascinating, is this thing called the Kwand effect. You've ever taken a spoon and put it under like running water? And when you put a curved spoon under water, it curves around, right? All fluids do that. The air is a fluid. So as this Frisbee flies through the air, you notice it's curved, right? Basically, as it passes over the air, all the air then turns and follows the curvature down. And basically what's happening is it's throwing air all around it down as it flies like a jetpack. <laughs> so like as a frisbee goes through the air, just like if you're wearing a jetpack, how it's like you're pushing air down, which again, equal opposite reaction makes you go up. A frisbee is freaking jetpacking itself through the air as it flies by. 
And that's what makes it fly and coast so well, which is amazing. If you took the same Frisbee and you had sharp edges, wouldn't fly nearly as well. Friends with Benefits has a very meta rom-com. Like yeah. it kind of pokes fun of the genre throughout. Be careful, very I'm careful around the eyes. I'm not touching the back yeah. of my hands. What do you think is a quality that separates a good rom-com from a mediocre one? Ooh, that's a great question. Chemistry. I think that the two people have to like enjoy being in the same scenes together and enjoy being there. I think that it has to be relatable, it has to be aspirational, and it has to serve as a purpose other than just you need a man or you need a woman. So recently you covered men's health, and for good reason, since I know that you've been tirelessly training at the CK gym that you recently <laughs> built with your friends. Yes, yes, the CK, okay, okay. You have a very aggressive, sort of high-flying style of play. What is the key to a hard-driven spike? Ooh, very good question. Uh, timing is more important than pure vertical. So, you know, if you have a good setter, he's setting at a, a really kind of like nice height where the ball is nice and floaty, and uh, you want to basically watch for the apex. You want to uh, watch out for the apex of, of that set. And once that ball starts to begin its downward trajectory, that's when you want to launch yourself in the air so that you're making contact with the ball at the highest possible place. You want to keep that ball in front of you. You don't want to spike it too far over because that just like, it, you know, that's not where you're going to get your power from. You want to hit it like right here and then you want to give the wrist a nice little snap as you're making contact with the ball. So apex, you go up. You're kind of targeting it with your with your non-dominant hand, and then you kind of snake out, snap that wrist, and uh, and then you, that's uh, that's that spikes town, baby. And then watch the bodies hit the floor. So you've worked closely with director Ryan Coogler and have interesting thoughts about how to take something with the size and scale of a Hollywood blockbuster, but still give it a real point of view. What have you learned by working with each other about navigating the intersection of art and commerce? Oh, that's such a good question. I think it's like amazing to have your own autonomy to get to do whatever you want, but it's also incredible to be able to make something that you know a lot of people are going to be able to see, and especially on a global scale. And that's like, that's such a rare gift that not that many filmmakers make, and particularly filmmakers that come so steeped in the independent world. You get so so uh, much access and sometimes I think there is this thing of like more money more problems you know as yeah, soon as yeah, you have yeah. money there are people like really telling you how to spend it but I've never seen someone deal with that more gracefully than Ryan I also think so much you make these things and you put them out into the world and they're not yours anymore anyways you know um, which is the beautiful and terrifying thing about them <laughs> Ed, you're a man of many talents, from stand-up comedy, to acting, to playing the banjo. But I know that it all began, the roots of it all, were in commercial narration. People might be surprised to know how prolific you were as a voiceover actor, but have you ever done an ad read with a billion Scovilles coursing through your body? Today, just maybe. If you'll humor me, I have some ad copy for you. <laughs> And I'm hoping that we can close out the show today with some throwback Ed Helms commercial narration. Yeah. Well, you did your research, by the way. <laughs> You've asked some very, like, uh, some sort of deep cut questions here. I'm very impressed. And yeah, not a lot of people know I used to do voiceover for, for commercial, but, but I did. And I will do it for this. <clears throat> If you or a loved one has been diagnosed with mesothelioma, you, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Mesothelioma is a rare cancer linked to asbestos exposure. Exposure to asbestos in shipyards, mills, heating, construction, or the automotive industries may put you at risk. Call that 800 number right now Wait and a minute. look at you, Ed Helms. Did I just endorse something? <laughs> it's some like ambulance chaser law firm or something? What just happened? Thank you for having me and, and, and knowing so much about me. <laughs> Knowing more about than I do. You're the best. Great job. Great job. You're a great interviewer, man. You're one of the best in the game. You proper care. It's great. Well, I, I love yeah, that. You know, I do. You know. I feel, it feels and I so. think it's only right. You know, if we're gonna have you jump through this hoop, we got to jump through a couple ourselves. Yeah, right? but you don't have to. You don't have to care as much as you do. You do. You really do. It's really amazing. Oh. Like even watching your interviews, it's proper. So thank you for that.
It's such a thrill and it's a pleasure. My man. favorite part of my job is diving in the material and watching God, so many you movies. And I ended up great in great the... questions. Oh, thank you. you. Fucking I read. That. Like, honestly, the best questions I've, I've, I can recall being asked. Uh, I, I think ever. That was amazing. I honestly, I, I don't know where you get these uh, questions from, but they are. Well, I know because I've seen the show that they are very surprising and incredibly well researched. Oh. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it's it's nice to, it's not just the wings, it's also nice to have a, you know, have some shit to talk about that's not, you know, the usual. I'm so classic. happy, dude, I'm so happy to be back. I'm so happy to be here. Like, this is the best show ever. You, you are the best dude. host, you are genuinely the best host because you are such a beautiful person, man. Like, it's, 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 Mind blowing how great you are. <laughs> Give me a hug, buddy. I love you. I love you too. Honestly, dude, you're the best. I appreciate the deep cuts, man. Oh yeah, thank you. We got you. We have to for Simo. Thanks for doing so much research. You guys really, like, you got into some like obscure stuff. I appreciate it. Well, you know, if we're gonna have you eat these wings, then we gotta meet you. Halfway. Make it worth. <laughs> make it worthwhile. Absolutely. That was really crazy and so much fun. I love the questions and the things that you brought up. <laughs> It's the best way to do an interview. It's like magic. Sean is the coolest guy in the fucking world.